you got a failed suicide vest and you have a full magazine of AK-47-762 coming at you within feet and you do not get hit. This is in, in the book, Unafraid, where the guy clacks himself off. The roof raises off the building. I get knocked off my little perch that I was looking on. Your team sends back up to help us out. I was in an adjacent building, went into this room. Thankfully, I went in alone and there was a guy hiding behind the stack of something. He sprayed in my direction with an AK-47, covered the whole wall with bullet holes, and somehow he missed me. We're feet apart. I come out of that room. I'm on it. I'm like... Pat myself down for <laughs> holes. Someone like grabs me and starts patting me down. I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. He was wearing a suicide vest that failed to detonate. So I got really wow. lucky. How you guys doing? Welcome to another Unafraid podcast. We're super excited to bring you this episode with a really good friend for both Keith and myself. Uh, his name is Eric Frohart, and he is just, uh, I've operated with him uh, on the battlefield. I've done leadership seminars with him, team building things, uh, workouts with him. Like the guy is just is about as awesome as they come. He's an example. He's a mentor. He's a, he's a really good dude. So if I would vouch for anybody, this would be one of the guys right here for sure. So I'm going to read off a little bit of his bio right here because there's there's just too much for me to um, to memorize. But he's a former Navy SEAL, medically retired at 12 years, which we will get into. He was at SEAL Team 5 and then again in our Tier 1 unit, which is where I met him. And we, we're going to go over a, a specific op that I talk about here in Unafraid back in 2008. Eric was there with me uh, on the same op operation so when the craziness happened he has a different vantage point which is really cool to get it i actually when we did the podcast uh, learned a lot about it uh, it, it cleared up a lot of things uh, that finally come that, that finally came out so currently he is the coo for defy which is a leader in performance beverages and wellness products and he's also a professional speaker specializing in teamwork and leadership. And this, this guy is about as awesome as they come. So hope you guys enjoy. It's a great podcast. So we got myself, Keith, and of course, Eric in here. So enjoy. All right. So Fro, you know both of us. So this isn't really an introduction, but the, the listener viewer may not know you. Let's start out with where you grew up. Yeah, I grew up uh, on a farm in Northwest Iowa and, uh, I don't know how deep you want me to go. I was in, uh, I played college, I'm sorry, played high school football and uh, really loved it. Uh, I went to college for one year, uh, a junior college, to, uh, to go chase, chase my dream of being like a, a major college football player. Um, I have a, you know, my, my dad and my uncles and my younger brothers are bigger so I kind of thought I was just slow on the growth spurt. So I was going to go to college, JUCO for a year, hit my growth spurt, and then go play Division I football. Uh, clearly, that did not happen. <laughs> uh, so What position which, were you playing, bro? I was an inside linebacker. So ah. you could just imagine I was cannon fodder. So um, I, I was really decent in high school. And then I you know, kind of found out it was big fish, small pond. I went to a, a junior college that had some mostly kids from other states. And I mean, we had kids. This is a little junior college called Nyack in Northwest Iowa, North Iowa area community college. And there were kids from Texas, Florida, Tennessee. There were kids who would go on to play for Ohio State, Nebraska, wow. Ames, the Iowa Hawkeyes. So now, Iowa junior college program is a big division one feeder. And I didn't really know that it was, it was kind of like a lot of kids there to get their grades up who were super talented. And, uh, you know, I was kind of frustrated by that because I wasn't, I wasn't big enough or fast enough, uh, to play at that level. And then, uh, you know, one night in, you know, I think the football season was over. We we're having a few beers in a dorm room and, uh, some movie about the SEAL teams was on and I was just kind of like a couple of 
couple of natural lights into it and I stood up and I like declared, I'm, you know, I'm over all this. I'm going to join the Navy and become a SEAL. And uh, there was, there was a girl in that dorm room, a girlfriend of one of my friends at the time. And she was like, in a very stuck up way, she's like, there's no way you could ever do it. You're not big enough, strong enough, tough enough or whatever. So I actually enlisted in the Navy the next day. So wow. uh, I essentially love you showed her. That's on awesome. A, <laughs> on a on a bet. On a bet, I couldn't do it. So, you know, that that bet was a ended up costing me 12 years plus. So whatever. But, but you got good. to the tip of the spear, I which did. is which is awesome. That's hilarious. And for those of you that don't know where Iowa is, it's a state in the United <laughs> States in the middle of the country. It's it's in there. It is there. <laughs> it is definitely in the middle um i was with, with yeah, good I was people great great midwestern folks yep. uh, and you know we'll probably get into it now now i live in nebraska same kind of people here awesome awesome people but uh yeah i i was one i was that guy in my buds class when they you know they said all right who's never been in the ocean before and I was dumb enough to raise my hand because uh, really the first time I saw the ocean was SEAL training. So, um, welcome. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. I thought they were. I thought they were going to like take me out to the water and like give me a familiarization with you know currents and such. And they just took me out there and surf tortured me until I shivered or stopped shivering. So <laughs> that's a good way to get familiar, though. You'd I be got like, okay. So this sucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got caught up quickly. That's funny. So your joining the military was all pretty much because of this girl saying I'm, something. I mean, I'm sure there's other things, but that's kind of the, yeah, yeah. the tipping point. That was like, yeah, the, that was the tipping point. Like a lot of it had to, you know, I had a chip on my shoulder. I wanted to go, wanted to go do something different, something hard. Um, I don't know. It's kind of a perfect, you know, it was just a perfect, uh, storm of frustration with football not sure what I wanted to study in college you know just having uncertainty around what I was going to you know do for a living and I you know I have I was very impressionable you know when I was a younger kid growing up right. in the 80s any any action movie that I watched changed my career path so same I, I, I feel you <laughs> And, and at that moment, at that moment, I, I had watched, I had watched a SEAL movie m many years before that, the, you know, the Charlie Sheen movie came out when I was like in junior high. And I kind of thought it was cool, but I put it on hold. And then, mm -hmm. cause I wanted to chase this football thing. And, right. um, you know, the football thing ended up being like one of those, one of those unanswered prayers that I was just very grateful did not get you know i didn't get my wish mm -hmm. and uh you know and then that and then for whatever reason the seal thing popped back up on my radar and it, it just something in that moment clicked and uh you know and then i started actually instead of doing you know for football training you're doing power cleans and bench press i had to wake up in the middle of the night and eat twice to try and keep weight on and mm -hmm. i certainly was not a fast twitch kind of guy right mm -hmm. jumping and sprinting but the moment I, you know, switched my training to, you know, some strength training, some body weight training, and then just like endurance, like I was like, oh, I'm really good at this, right? Like I was one of the, you know, we had two people in my buds class who like never failed to run, a swim, a no course or, uh, or anything. And I, you know, was one of those. So, uh, but I never, I mean, I never won any of them, but I was just kind of decent at all of them. So it was a, it was a switch for me, at, you know, from going to fast twitch football to, you know, endurance. Being a football player, did you come in with any injuries that, that kind of lingered? No, I was pretty lucky to, you know, get out of football unscathed. And uh, oddly when I stopped, I stopped like heavy bench pressing and that sort of thing. My shoulders started to actually feel good. Right. It's Cause I noticed like, ah, uh, my shoulders are always hurting or, you know, my back would hurt a little from, you know, heavy squats and whatever. So, I mean, I, I came in when I, when I, when I kind of cut down to, you know, whatever, 180 and I was doing the endurance training, uh, I, I came in 
I came in pretty injury free. All that stuff that you kind of grew up because we're how old are you right now? Uh, forty four. Yeah, so we're forty, same age. So like all those muscle and fitnesses, like all the things that they yeah, bench press, squat, dead, like oh, all yeah. those things. I find decades later are the ones that cause X, Y, and Z injuries. It's like, dude, like, man, if I would have known this. And I've come to find out now that I, you know, it's, it's not always the poison, it's the dose or it's the right. Yeah. That's a, that's and, a good way to put it. So when I, you know, if I would have been smarter about it, I mean, we probably grew up, you know, benching four to five days a week followed uh-huh. by, followed by curls. Right now, if we could, you know, re- rewind, we probably would do it different. And, and certainly, you know, nowadays you can just watch, you can get so much good content on how to do it in a manner that protects your shoulder and same yeah. thing with deadlifting. And, you know, we're, we're in high school, we're trying to do power cleans because we saw it in like this book called bigger, faster, stronger. Right. And we're trying to learn how to do power cleans from a book that's de- describing steps one through 15 or whatever. And that's just, you know, I know now that's not the way, not the way to do it. Right. Yeah, that's true. Did you have siblings? Did you grow up in the church? Like, well, let's give us a little background about like kind of your upbringing. Yeah, no, I grew up, uh, grew up, I have two brothers and a sister. I'm the oldest. Um, Obviously grew up working on the farm, playing football, you know, doing all the Midwestern stuff. And uh, yeah, grew up going to church, always Sunday church, and then some sort of a youth group. And that was usually on like Thursday night or something like that. So pretty much uh, wasn't like really an option it was always. <laughs> right. Is your par- parents married the whole time? And so, yep. I mean, still, yep. still married, gotcha. still up there in Iowa. So that's awesome. That's, yep. that's rare, which is so sad yep. to say it's, it's rare, but yep. that's awesome. Any crazy small town, Midwestern fast times at Ridgemont high. <laughs> yeah I, I i mean we would it you know it's pretty you know pretty innocent kind of place really i mean you kind of get bored and what do you do you drive around on a gravel road or whatever um there were there were times we had like you know parties at a farm during the county fair or something like that but it was you know whoever had some beer or whatever um, pretty, pretty tame by, you know, today's standards, some of the stuff you read. So, uh, but yeah, we, I mean, we, we did have, there were times people would take tractors to prom. There were times, you know, we had parties at this uh, or a party out in the, on a gravel road or whatever, um, kind of like that, but nothing, I mean, nothing epic. Um, I think one year I entered a, I bought a car for $75 that, Wow. It was like an old, you know, I had a pickup at the time and this car, I bought it from someone and it had, uh, it was like a, uh, hmm, it was the Pontiac version of the, of the Monte Carlo, whatever that is. I forget uh, Grand Prix. And uh, it was like a 79 Grand Prix. It had a, like, don't quote me on this, but like a 400 cubic inch engine. I had a four barrel carburetor and it was burning oil or whatever. So the guy's like, I want to get rid of it, but I'll sell it to you for 75 bucks. And I bought it and I busted the windows out of it and put some chicken wire on it and entered it in a, <laughs> in a, in a figure eight race. And that's I, awesome. So in a figure eight race, you're like guaranteed to get T-boned in the middle. And I totaled it. And then I had to try and drive it back to the farm and the, like the tires were broken. It was bare. It was kind of wobbly. So I'm driving it back to the farm and uh, I told you I broke out the windows and it starts hailing on me and it, uh, it's kind of like coming in sideways. So that's yeah, great. I mean, that's, that's like, that's pretty much it. <laughs> I've never heard of a figure eight race. I've heard of like pretty much bumper cars with, you know, normal cars, but I've never heard of the figure eight thing. That's actually pretty cool. That'd be fun I to think, watch. Yeah. You get a little, like you get a little more speed going than a classic like demolition derby. Uh huh. Cause you're kind of going around, but like, right. you know, you're bound to get hammered in the middle. Oh, right? heck yeah. Eventually. So, yeah. In yeah, central Florida, cool. they have figure eight school bus racing. Yeah. I see. So I've seen next that. level. Yeah, yeah. That is next <laughs> level. 
with with passengers in the bus. So it's right, cool right. Little, little kids. <laughs> they get to throw stuff, hit people. All right. So you you go through buds and then what what uh take us a little bit of kind of the military career up to the pinnacle where you and I met. Uh so you yeah. went to West Coast, I think, right? Yeah, I made it through buds. Um and then you know, you go to jump school at the time, right? Army jump school, did that, took a little leave, showed up at SEAL Team 5, then had to go through, uh, it was called STT, SEAL Tactical Training. Um, and then, yeah, I did a two pumps. Is, SEAL is team. that where you were at the team, right? For the six months, is that what? Okay, yeah. got you. You're at the team, but then you had to go through this, your TAD to this, they had a command, a training command there. So you would get like farmed out. Mm -hmm. Like there was a West coast STT. So Mm -hmm. there'd be non seal buds graduates from one, three and five. There, there was no seven yet. Okay. And and you would go through it together as a class. And then it was a, it was a three month thing. Uh, And when you were done with that, you went back to your team and fulfilled the remaining two or three months of your probationary period until you, you know, you got your trident. So. Gotcha. So that got replaced with SQT, SEAL qualified training. So, which is combined everyone. So it was just West coast or I guess the East coast probably did the same thing. I'm I'm imagining. Yeah. So, okay. So now there's SQT and they, it's cool. I mean, they get to graduate that and they show up at a team with a trident. It was like, it was real weird. Like, you know, you're a new guy, you're at a team, you're a buds graduate, but you know, you're not a, you're not a seal yet. Yeah. I mean, like, so just being able to, I don't know, I think it's cool now the way they do it and they have their own in-house, you know, parachuting and whatever. Right. Yeah. It's definitely got a lot better. The pipeline, just keeping everything Mm -hmm. like in our pipeline, not going out to other, I think is is a good thing. So we got, yeah, we, the army did not love us, you know, no, no, <laughs> it wasn't great. We didn't, we didn't love them. No. So great. Nothing against army people, but those schools, man, gosh, like yeah. anything but that. Yeah. No, and, and, and you know, we've come to know some people we know and love in the army, uh, you know, Rangers, Green Berets. Right. Of course. Uh, other yeah. operators, but like just going through having finished buds and then going to, you know, army jump school is like, right shell shock culture please shock. please stop i'm gonna quit yes. <laughs> just because you're talking um all right so you do that how many how many deployments did you do with the regular shield teams before you crossed over two um two and you had to yeah um so you had to do your two and then you know i had uh did the one uh my first deployment was like august 15th of 2001 so we're overseas for about oh, wow. two and a half weeks uh, 9-11 happens. So we're supposed to stay in, you know, we're in Guam. And uh, that deployment was originally intended to be a Pacific cruise, you know, kind of bounce around from Guam to Thailand to PI to Australia and Malaysia and whatever. And then. Sounds you know, visible. Get, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we end up getting sent to, you know, we, ha- we happened to be over there during, you know, right around 9-11 or during 9-11. So three weeks after that, you know, we're on a plane heading to the desert and uh, we're thinking, Oh, we're going to Afghanistan. And uh, you know, that wasn't the case. We ended up landing, I'll just say somewhere. And uh, there was, there were people there like, well, you're in the wrong spot. And we end up, (laughs) so we end up going to Kuwait um, to replace a seal team three platoon. So they could go to Afghanistan. Um. And we, we, we took their duty to do the, uh, the underway shipboarding. Um, so it, it ended up working out because at one point we ended up coming, you know, at the command, they're like, uh, well, who here has ever done non-compliant real world underway shipboarding? And I was like, me, I, you know, had, I got to do that. So, and I had some, I think we ended up on that deployment. You know, they say we're, you know, looking for, Al Qaeda and such fleeing Afghanistan, but you know, it's not like a lot of them are jumping on boats in Iran and trying to right. come out of the Arabian Gulf. But yeah, you know, we chased down some tankers, embargoed oil, looking for, you know, terrorists and stuff that were fleeing. But we end up doing like 
15 or 20 uh, boardings. So some of which I got to be the, you know, the lead climber for on like a 20 plus foot underway that's awesome, you know, man. hook and climb in the middle of the, you know, golf in the middle of the dark. So it was, that, you know, that's good experience right there. Like that's for a new guy. That's yeah, oh heck. Yeah. That, that was great. <laughs> that's like unheard of actually. Yeah. That's awesome. That's freaking sweet. So you do, you do, that was your first one. Where'd you go on your second one? Did you go to Iraq on that one or Afghanistan? Second one, we went to literally Okinawa and we were supposed to, we were going to go there and we were either going to go, we were going to go there for a few months and then get sent to Iraq. And then that didn't materialize. And we ended up going to that one. We ended up bouncing around, uh, you know, the Philippines, Thailand and, and other stuff. And that, you know, it ended up being, it ended up being a lot of fun because, you know, I would get my share of Iraq and Afghanistan after that. At the time, mm-hmm. I really hated it. I just wanted right. to go to war. Uh, but, you know, we kind of bounced around and got to see some things that I, you know, I'm glad I got to see. Uh, but the funny thing is between those two deployments, I lost a kidney. Um, and that was on a training trip. And it was just a misdiagnosis that I've had for a long, long time that led to, uh, having a blockage in my kidney with a, a stone. They went in to try and fix it. And when they, they went there in there to try and fix it, they realized, oh, they can't really sal- salvage my kidney. So they um, basically, I went in for a one hour surgery on, you know, getting my something fixed. And I woke up nine hours later, you know, in Balboa hospital without a kidney. <laughs> so, wow. And, uh, that was the weekend that they, that next week they were screening, you know, for the, for the command. And obviously I couldn't screen cause you know, my abs were cut basically a more than a foot. I couldn't do a, I could barely stand up, let alone do the sit-ups and stuff. So, How long was recovery for that? It was pretty long. Cause they cut all the way through, you know, my abdominal wall, if you can mm-hmm. imagine, um, no, I don't want to. It took a while. It took a while. But, you yeah. know, I, I signed a waiver to stay in the military, as I had mentioned. Um, I mean, I was on the hospital bed, basically kicked out of the Navy. And this guy uh, from Team 5 Medical, he's like, hey, like, I got a waiver if you want to stay in. And I'm like, you know, still on morphine, signing the waiver. And, uh, you know, I was in a lot of pain and such. And then, you know, I ended up, so that was in October. I got married in December and then I deployed for nine months in like January uh, or early February. And then uh, came home from that deployment and uh, right away did the screen test and um, had a year, about a year to kill. So I went to the, to trade it, which proved helpful. Right. So you, I guess, just to get back on your feet, like a hundred percent, as best as you could. So you, were you, did you go Oh, four, Oh, five, Oh, three. What, what selection course were you? Five, five. Okay. Got you. Mm-hmm. So you go over to our tier one units, uh, over to the command, you go through selection and op tempos pretty ridiculous. Can you take us yeah. through maybe a couple ops? I want to, I'm going to jump on an op in particular when I sure. think it was to our, the Bakuba uh, deployment, but how, how was that? How was the op tempo? Like how that play into family, the yeah. kid, all, all that stuff. Cause that's, that's, that's a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. A lot going on. So yeah, I, I finished, you know, my training. Uh, I had a week off my, our squadron was already deployed. So I, had a week off and then I, they sent me over there. Um, so me and one other new guy moved into a room in Iraq with two guys who'd been there. How um, long were they over? They were uh, about, I think they were, mm, I want to say a month and a half in. So we came for the, you know, the last month and a half, um, which was great to get that experience. But it was also like, we hadn't done a workup with them. So we're fresh out of just kind of selection CQB and rolling right into that. And it was just way faster. You know, you mm-hmm. don't get that work up. So right. uh, as far as op tempo, I think, you know, similar to you, it's probably gone 
sometimes 280 to 300 days a year. Um, somehow made it home every time we had a kid born, which was good. <laughs> um, we ended up, we ended up having, uh, I ended up having three kids while I was there. And then, uh, when we got out, you know, we had one more, so I have four now. Uh, but it was just, yeah, running and gunning, you know, constantly, if you weren't deployed, you were training and you know, a lot of crazy training trips at the time. Um, I have said before, you know, I got to go do some really epic climbing adventures and some other stuff like that, but it's a lot of fun, but you you know, it's hard on the, hard on the body, hard on the family. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know if there's a way around it, but I, I, I we get a lot of questions cause I kind of, especially with the book, I vomited a lot of stuff and yeah, pretty much said I was not there for my family. I put the, the team and my boys first, uh, but you have a, good marriage. I've, I've been with you yep. a long time and it's been like that. So a, a common question is like, how do you balance that? What is the way? And I would have to defer to you because you actually did it. I, I failed on that. I kind of look back in hindsight, like, man, I should have done this, this, and this, right. but you know, you, you did that, you, which, which I applaud you for. Uh, what, what was like the key, like, what'd you guys do you and your wife? Well, I mean, I think it's obviously it took, it took hard work from both of us. Right. Um, you know, I, pro I certainly could have been better. Like when I was, you know, when I was there, it, you know, my, my identity was first and foremost, you know, seal operator. Then after that husband, then after that father, but like, right. that was my priority. Um, and maybe it needed to be so that, you know, when you went overseas, you came home al alive. Right. So uh, but she was really cool through it, through it all. So maybe she was just really cool. Uh, but mm -hmm. we, you know, we, uh, um, I don't really, I don't know the best advice other than, you know, I would, I, I would say I, I definitely wasn't always like, I would go on a lot of trips, but if there was like, if there was a trip where, you know, someone had couldn't go and whatever, I wasn't going to always once, once I had done a couple of deployments, I was no longer going to go on unnecessary trips. I'm gotcha. going to try to try to be home. And when I'm home, I'm home. And, you know, I would do my best, um, you know, I'd show up at work early, get my workout done, but I wasn't going to usually, obviously there were exceptions, but usually I'm mm -hmm. not going to hang around in the team room at night drinking <laughs> and doing all that now. I mean, obviously there were times that we did that together, right? But, right. Yeah. Just trying to, trying to balance it and be in rhythm and whatever. But I think also what really probably helped us the most was that my wife had some really good friends. Mm -hmm. so there were times when, you know, I would come home and, you know, and she's like, Oh, you're back. But I had, I was having so much fun. And also they all went through it at the same time doing the same thing. So she had these, this very close group of friends, some military, some not, mm -hmm. but we were all like literally within weeks or months had that, you know, those, those women were having babies at the same time. So they're right. constantly doing like going to the Barnes and Noble or the my gym or whatever it was. So they are, mm -hmm. you know, they could keep themselves busy while, you know, I was overseas. <laughs> yeah, that, that community helps, man, like big Huge. time, because if you don't have that learning now, like it'll it'll destroy you. I mean, it'll it's a killer. Yeah. Um, Bro, I got a, a question. Sorry, um, go for it. Given that you were, let's say, more engaged with the family than Eddie. Um, thanks. Did Steve. you ever feel that, any, that yeah, rough. To, thanks, thanks, Bob. <laughs> they, uh, did you ever feel any pushback or anything from other team guys like, oh, you're not putting in enough time or was that not an issue? No, I. I not really. Um, cause I would put in, I would put in more than, more than was needed. Like I was, you know, no one would ever question like if I was like ready for a trip or, you know, a good enough shot or a good enough operator or whatever. Like I was always, always, I was always like, I would train hard on my own. Um, I would, you know, I'd take, check my gun out and constantly be, you know, shooting on my own. And, you know, my gear was always squared away. Um, 
and I would, you know, if I was behind on something, I'd make time to go, uh, to go get it done. So yeah, not, not really, but it's a good, you know, sometimes <laughs> there, there were guys who, you know, they'd show up at the last minute and they had a long weekend and, Oh, their you know, their bag wasn't packed or something like that. I definitely didn't fall into that bucket. Kind of. When did you guys of, meet? I came, I was in green team, I think a year or two after, so I can't remember when I got to the command. I think it was like 05 or 06. Would you say, when was your selection? 05. Okay, so I was 06. I came in at 06. So a year after? Yep. So my first one is when part of us went to out west to work with two troop. And the I think that was an outstation for our troop. Because we were in the same troop the whole time, I believe. Yep. So that was the first one. And then the second one was i can't that wasn't the bakiba one was it no. it was like i can't i can't even put them all together but that yeah. that's what we we met was they're all kind of a mesh they, uh, it's like i can't even couldn't even tell you but i want to go into that kind of week that, that bakiba a little bit the, the yeah. craziness so just so uh, just to give the listeners kind of a background we talk about this a lot in the book the first the first part we lost a couple guys in the span of a uh, of a week and so the first one we lost, uh, Mike and Nate, um, which was just, it was bad. And the way the target was, was our element went to two different places. Our team, my team three. went, do we, we have three? No, we had, yeah, we went to three little mini compounds. Okay. Okay. But two of them were like to connected, right? In the same yeah, car yeah. or something like that. So we went to the three places and then that's what we were doing the call out. And the guy, this is in, in the book, Unafraid, where the guy clacks himself off, kills his kids. And like in the book, I get knocked off by a little perch that I was looking on, like the roof raises off the building. So you guys, your team sends backup to help us out because all the chaos was going on from what I remember. And then I don't know how I, much. And I was in an adjacent building. Right. We had done a, a call out and I had. So take us there. <laughs> yeah. This was like Super Bowl Sunday. You know, yep. we, had our, we had our bets placed. We had made squares. I think we had even paid for Domino's Pizza. And then we were totally planning on not working that night. And then we got our pagers went <clears> off. <throat> we had to go work. And uh, yeah, long story long, I had. I kind of went into this room, a very small room. I had cleared it from the doorway to the extent that I could, and there was no one in there. Um, and thankfully I went in alone because um, we were just trying to go soft and get quickly into all the rooms. And I, you know, I stepped on something in the doorway, made some noise, and there was a guy hiding behind those stack of something uh, and he had sprayed, you know, he sprayed in my direction with an AK-47 and, uh, you know, covered the whole wall with bullet holes. And, you know, I started running and shooting and somehow he missed me. Obviously, I got him. Uh, and we're, I mean, we are, you know, we're feet apart, right? Like maybe 12 feet apart. And he's spraying. And, and of course, it's dark. Uh, I don't see him. All I see is muzzle flash. But he's spraying me. Um, you know, we had engaged one of his bodyguards in the doorway, which I had to kind of step over. He's spraying me, I'm shooting him and moving. And, you know, I come out of that room and like, basically we're in a really small kind of entryway, not even, it's like an entryway going into a main room. And like, there's two people who just shot a magazine. So there's like two magazines, you know, empty. I come out of that room. I'm on there. I'm like, pat myself down for <laughs> holes and someone like grabs me and starts patting me down. I'm like, I'm fine. I'm fine. He's like, I can't believe you didn't, you know, get, get shot. And we found out later the guy, you know, he was ended up being the whatever somebody. And uh, he was wearing a suicide vest that failed to detonate. So I got really wow. lucky. So not wow. only did he, not only did he, <clears throat> me, that vest failed. So we had to, you know, dispose of the vest and, whatever and, and literally you know five minutes later similar situation adjacent building adjacent compound obviously a harder room because there was a pk in there mike and nate got shot so uh along with two others mike and nate you know were killed. so that was our that was our super bowl if you will <laughs> um mm -hmm. which was 
you know, I, for me, very, uh, you know, very bittersweet. Like on the one hand, you have the high of the high to go into that room. You know, your tactics and your techniques save you from that. You engage this guy at close range in a literal 50, 50. And, uh, you know, obviously it's better to be lucky than good. It's good to be both, but I came out Mm -hmm. of that room and, you know, just very, you know, high on life, (laughs) obviously, but bittersweet, you know, within, you know, within minutes later, we had, you know, four of our teammates shot, two of them killed, you know, we had to get their bodies and put them in body bags and walk to a helicopter and all of that. So that, and that was like, whatever, two nights or three nights before Louis Mm -hmm. died. Yeah. It's like, yeah, something like that. What, uh, going back to that, how many, how many times does that play in your head? A lot. into that room. Well, it's funny. Like I would, at first I would not even really think about it. And then I would start to like, okay, I have to go back there and like, what did I do wrong? And did I get lucky? And cause I'm always trying to improve myself. Right. right? And I'm like, okay, you know, maybe I did get a little lucky. I mean, obviously I did. Um, but yeah, I've replayed it many, many times. Like, um, like, what would I do different? Uh, and I don't know. I mean, I don't know if there, <laughs> I don't know if there's anything I would have done different, you know? So, uh, but I've replayed it a few times for sure. When you come up with things, and there's a reason why I asked this question, um, you know, you got a failed suicide vest and you have a full magazine of AK-47, 762 coming at you within feet and you do not get hit we just have a poorly trained guy. Yeah. Cause I, me- I remember the network, the network was very bad because they took out yep. three of our guys and they were known for their suicide vests. Uh, they were, they were, they were, they were formidable enemies. They were, they were, oh, yeah. for, and, and in my opinion, and I'm sure in yours as well. So more so than any I had chased. Yeah. Yeah. Point, especially, especially in Iraq. Yeah. Especially yep. in Iraq. So, I mean, what's your, like, what do you come up with? What would you, uh, uh, coincidences? Yeah. Uh, no, I come not up a with a thing. You know, hey, I, you know, I, I, I had more to go do, right? Yeah. So, and I, you know, survived for a reason. So, yeah. Um, and, you know, I, probably days later, that was reinforced. You know, my whole team was sent home. You know, our, our EOD guy was killed and my whole team was injured enough to be sent home. And I was the mm-hmm. only one, only one left. And that's only like, whatever, two or three days after that, two or three nights after that. So then, and at, at that point, people are like rubbing my camis for good luck because they're, you know, like Mm -hmm. it was, it was just, you know, whatever. Um, Yeah. That was the talk of the camp, the spread around your body pretty much. Yeah. uh, Which is crazy. So like you, you just kind of went into, so a couple of nights later we go on another op. And again, if I, I talk about this in Unafraid a lot because this made a huge impact on my life, like tremendously. This is probably the craziest deployment with losing so many guys so close uh, yeah. to me, to both of us. So we go to, I, I asked Louie to go, because I'm taking over our team leaders because he was uh, he was sick that night. So I was kind of filling him in. And then he, I asked um, Louie Louis to go up to the pillar. There's that big stanchion in front of the door. And I moved up with him because it was just a gaggle. Yep. You guys were stacked, and I'll have you do your side. You guys were stacked to the – as I'm looking at the front of the building to the right side, and Louis on this big pillar, and I move up to him because there's just tons of tons of men co- around. There's women and children. It's just chaos. Like, it's just nothing's getting done. We're trying to get people back so we can clear it up so you guys, as being the initial assault team, can make entry yeah. uh, or, or do whatever you got to do. And for some reason, um, I heard this voice, like, get away. Like, And I, I've never done that – um, Fro, you know me, man. I've got that terrified of missing stuff syndrome. Like yeah. I got to be there, the first guy, right? Uh, it's just something told me to leave, and I and I asked him if he's okay, and I left. Yeah. And as soon as I wrap the wall, the building explodes. So can you can you take us like your angle on that side because this is like this is good stuff. Like this is giving me clarity of that night. Uh, yeah. Just you know. Yeah, we had gone up to the initial breach. Um, after whatever um obviously we needed an eod guy who normally was with y'all so i knew he was up there near us and um i would have been you know as a point man for that team 
So I usually be the first one to the doorway, first one in the door, you know, the door's already open, right? Um, for whatever reason, I peeled off because I had heard some noise in the, uh, there was a window, like a big window right in front of, you know, a couple feet in front of the main door. So when I peeled off and I, I pied into that window with my gun, I saw like at least one, maybe two people that had guns pointed at the main door. So I was looking through the window. There was no glass there. It was just like a curtain. And I saw them basically guns pointed at the entry, getting ready to shoot whoever came in. So, but they didn't see me, you know, looking through that window. So I engaged them. And then I remember somebody, okay, now there's shots fired. Presumably there's bad guys in there, obviously, because we had identified weapons. And then someone went to throw a grenade into the, into the doorway. And right when that went in, it was like, I was used to a certain delay from a grenade, but the explosion was immediate. And it was, and I was still by the window and that ended up saving me because I caught all that overpressure and it blew me. I just remember flying through the air with my hands and feet kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking like, for a moment, I was like, what kind of grenade was that? Like I thought, I, I thought the guy who threw the grenade threw some kind of like wazoo new grenade, uh, Travis. And I was like, what kind of grenade was that? Cause it <laughs> like the whole building blew up. I mean, we found out later, obviously the building was rigged to explode. And so I got thrown, you know, almost 30 feet across the, this compound. I bounced off a wall. I kind of came to, and, uh, you know, I couldn't, I mean, for a few minutes I could barely stand up and I would stand up and I'd get nauseous. So, you know, my bell was really wrong, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that whole initial assault team was crushed, you know, obviously with any, you know, all the way from Louie, you know, being killed and crushed by that carport to, you know, our dog handler had double compound femur fractures. Um, one guy crushed his arm. One guy crushed his hand. You know, everyone there who was around that was basically killed or sent home. And at the time, you know, I think he like knew I was a Christian, but I wasn't this, like, this oh. is Louie. Yeah. Okay. And I don't know if he was or not, but he was asking me questions about like, well, what do you believe and why do you believe it? And da, 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 da. And like, this is like, this is the one thing that haunts me. Like, I don't have a lot of reg regrets, but definitely do in this case. Cause I didn't like, I wasn't comfortable sharing it, like sharing my faith with him. Um, and I never really was. Um, and I, you know, obviously he died two nights later. Right. Uh, and I don't know what, you know, if he had faith or not, we didn't talk about it. Uh, I got the sense that he was, questioning it and he wanted to you know know more and i wasn't you know capable to articulate it and then uh you know later i had heard someone say and i i ha i don't i wish i could attribute this quote because i it stuck with me but you know he had said here i here i am willing to run into a building full of terrorists for the flag on my shoulder but i'm unwilling to share the story of uh you know of the cross with a friend and I'm like, that was like, ugh, you know, and especially in hindsight, you know, that, you know, Louie would die the next night. So wow, that's some made me stuff. like, wow. it was like, oh man, like, you know, like just makes that you want to. Yeah. Did that make so you open up more about your faith? Yeah. After, I mean, not right away. I just, it took me a little while to process it, but um, yes, definitely more. After. Why were you afraid to talk about your faith? I asked because that's very common um in you the know, world <laughs> yeah I, and we're in the teams and we're supposed to be wild guys partying having fun and you know all that like i don't i don't know it's just and maybe it's now that i'm older and i'm more mature and like just you know you get older you're more confident in things yeah um but yeah i mean i and it was i mean it was obvious to most people like you know i would talk about like oh yeah we went to church on sunday or whatever but i wasn't like at that point, like super confident in it. You know what I mean? Gotcha. So when gotcha. I talk to, you know, I'll talk to kids now about it. Like, Hey, you know, like, don't be afraid to, to share it. 
um because you never know gotcha and yeah that's true man that, that person might get blown up <laughs> it's great that's that is heavy yeah. that night produced some heavy stuff that people thought about for ye- years later yeah so yeah man it's freaking nuts dude right so you know most of them being sent home so uh anyway that's my vague recollection <laughs> and and again with the caveat that i you know I did have to get a CAT scan that night for the, you know, the brain injury. So. Oh, I'm, I'm sure, <laughs> which I'm sure you have a few of them. <laughs> yeah. I was the first. Mm-hmm. So what were the injuries you took away from that, from that op? You know, the injuries I got on that op were very minimal. Like I had a, I had a, I don't know if I got it from that op. I would later have some grenade frag come up to the top of my skin. I don't think I got it that, that op. The main injury that up was the concussion and I had to get medevaced and, you know, I felt really shitty going to the hospital in Balad where like people were missing like arms and, you know, Louie was in like a body bag right there and I'm sitting there with a concussion. I'm like, really, I'm kind of, I'm fine. Like, but because I had passed out, uh, they just wanted to make sure, you know, that I was, I was okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And I got out of there right away. Um, But, you know, that was, that was my injury, my main kind of big injury, just that, you know, getting blown up. So you were, were you transported with all the wounded, every one of them? Nope. Uh, I think they brought in strikers. Yeah. Uh, Brad, I think that Brad, they might have strikers. I know they have Bradley's too. Something like that. So I was with the least, I was with one of our teammates who was, we were considered the least injured. Like Louie was out of there right away as soon as they could mm-hmm. get his body out of the you know, wreckage. Um, and then I kind of went later and I didn't want to go, but you know, I couldn't, I actually couldn't stand up. So they just wanted to make sure I was okay. So from that, if I'm not mistaken, the kidney thing kind of comes back into play now, right? Yeah. So how, so how, did, from, how did that work? Yeah. I mean, from that, because I got, you know, because I got medevaced and, uh, you know, this is my purple heart. I got blown up. Right. But I really just, and I would later get some grenade frag that I didn't really even mention, but cause I got blown up and I got medevaced like, Oh, you know, you're going to get a purple heart. I was like, okay, whatever. I don't come to find out it, you know, it does mean something when your kids go to college later. So I do, uh, I encourage, you know, any active duty people who are listening and might make fun of that. Like it might help you later on. Anyway, if you, uh, if you deserve it anyway, I get, I get this. uh, I think the Bureau of Navy medicine has to like sign off on them because it's like a medical thing or whatever, but they, so they show up at the command and uh, they're like, well, where's this, you know, where's this pro heart at? Um, How's come he has a purple heart? Like he's not even supposed to be deploying. And it's because that, you know, that waiver I had signed, I was non-deployable. Well, you, which know, you didn't, which you didn't know about. Right. I just signed it. I was, you know, on morphine on a hospital bed. <laughs> hey, do you, do you want to stay in the Navy? And I'm sitting there like, you know, writing the, absolutely. So long story, you know, I, and this, so this would have been right, you know, a few months after, or a few I guess a month or so after that deployment, I forget. I was actually up on Denali climbing it. And, uh, you know, they're coming to the command to say I'm unfit <laughs> to be a, you know, to serve. So I fought it for a little while and then they kind of did a medical board and they're like, Hey, you can stay in the Navy. You just can't be deployable. And, uh, you know, I had 12 years in at the time. I had no interest in doing eight years at a desk. If I had like, you know, 16, 17, and I had to ride, write a desk for, you know, three or four, that might've been doable. But mm-hmm. at that point, like it wasn't going to happen. And, right. and, you know, I had started to get these, you know, had these close calls and, you know, I kind of talked to my wife about it and she's like, well, you know, we could fight it and you may, you may, you may actually, you know, prevail through it or they may just tell you the same thing. So mm-hmm kind of ended up getting a partial medical retirement. Sorry, my dog is barking. <laughs> yeah, you're good. You're good. Man, that's that's crazy, dude. I remember hearing about that afterwards. Um, so and I was like, what? I'm like, what? The kidney? I'm like, what? Huh? And then 
learning, you know, what it really was, but that, that's crazy, man. Yeah. That, uh, it's good to hear your side of the, of it all, because I replay that night often, like yeah. a lot, like it's one of those ones that just doesn't leave the brain box. And, yeah. uh, so just hearing from yours, cause that explains the guys drop by the front door. Cause I remember looking in and there was a guy, I could only see one guy like yep. halfway in the foyer area and halfway in some other room. So that makes sense. So yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. So that, that was it. That was the last deployment for me. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I, and I actually ended up, you know, doing this medical board and I, I end up finding out the final finding of it comes out uh, like maybe in whatever August of 09 and we're supposed to deploy in October of 09 or something like that. So it's just months before I'm supposed to go. They're like, well, you can't go. So then I only get like, I get like, instead of a three year twilight tour somewhere or two year, right. I get like, like I'm getting out in 2010. So I have like a few months to figure out my next move. So, which is not enough time. Right. So I mm-hmm. kind of left, left the Navy with no plan and, you know, went a while without the, uh, you know, a paycheck. So how was that stress? That was honestly, I mean, much harder than being in the teams. Oh right? yeah. Cause you know, you lose your identity, you know, you're no longer a seal and you're no longer important. And then, you know, you don't have a way to provide for your family. You don't have your team you don't, and you don't know what the heck you're doing. Right. So, I mean, I've said it before, like the, to me, it's much harder for me anyway, it was much harder to leave the teams than to join them and become a seal. I, I would uh, agree with that statement for sure. That's, that's a good way to put it. Climbing has come up a couple of times and that's kind of where you and I yeah, got to know each other a little better. Talk to us about that. Was that a, just something you had a passion for? I mean, you come from about the flattest state in America and now all of a sudden yeah. you're, you're the climber. How'd that happen? I have no idea. I've never, yeah, I'd, <laughs> so I had never climbed before in my life. Um, I was like, I thought it was cool, but I never had done it. So we had, uh, showed up, you know, at my team and, uh, every little team needs a lead climber. And the other guy was, you know, big and strong. So they made him a breacher and, uh, they made me, <laughs> made me a climber. And then I did a, I, I did like a four day rock climbing trip to Las Vegas, Red Rocks, um, after my first deployment and then another four day rock climbing trip somewhere else. So now I'm like sitting on eight days of rock climbing and I, you know, did some multi-pitch stuff and, you know, steep learning curve, but still like, whoa, this is, you know, it was fun, but you know, not too crazy. And literally like right after that, we went to climb El Cap. So it went from here to here to here to over like, so like the ninth, I think it was like the ninth time in my life that I put a sit harness on was the first day on El Cap. And that was like a training climb, you know, a practice thing. And we ended up, you know, we get two practice days there. We had a guide, but we had, you know, three man teams. We took turns leading pitches, cleaning pitches and hauling gear and such. It's a very complicated process, but it took us, you know, we summited right before sunset on the third day. So you spent two nights sleeping on the edge and uh, one night on the top. And it was uh, scarier than jumping out of a plane, I will say. <laughs> so the edge is like a bed on the side, right? Yeah, portal edge. Dude, no. <laughs> with, with a sit harness on and a cough. I had my, this is before really good instant coffee. So I had like a, a Nalgene coffee press that I'm trying to, make coffee on the side of this thing and we did that so I, we kind of got we kind of checked the box on the big wall and then we started doing some mountaineering trips so we did uh denali uh in would have been 08 um right after bakaba and then aconcagua in 09 um and that's kind of too keith where i like noticed how how well like kettlebell training prepared you for mountains is it really like you got strong, you, you know, you hit your strength, your cardio and all these things, and you didn't actually put on a lot of mass. Um, 
and man, there's nothing wrong with getting big and strong, but like in at altitude and in mountains, it, you know, it's, it's extra weight you're carrying uphill. So, um, yeah, that was, you and I knew each other, but you know, I'm, I'm a big hunter yep. and I had some mountain trips coming up and I had always struggled. I was living in Florida, basically at sea level. How do you prepare for 10,000, 12,000 feet? And you had prepared in Virginia beach, similar altitude for, for these big climbs. Um, so I tapped your brain and the advice you gave was, and I've written about it. I mean, it was so simple that I'm like, this can't possibly work. Right. And it's too simple. <laughs> that's right. I got, if I'm not dry heaving, it, it can't be good. Um, but got there and, and it was really well prepared. The kettlebells were huge, but the, I think the rucking was also a huge component of that. Yep. Cause there's no substitute for that spending that time under that weight. Yeah. The weight on your shoulders. Um, another thing like I've done is, uh, like walk, like just walking with a tire, which kind of simulates that uphill kind of walk. So, uh, but yeah, no, can't, can't substitute the, uh, the weight on your back. Um, and that just heavy swings or swings or, you know, whatever ballistic movement really kind of, it almost simulates walking uphill, not to get too, too much into a fitness podcast here, but, uh, yeah, it does work. <laughs> Speaking of that, you, you've spent some time around two big kind of names in the fitness world, Mark Twight and Pavel. Yeah. Let's start with Mark. Cause I think that came first. What was that? How did you guys get to know each other and how did his methodologies train the way that you look at things? Yeah, it was so cool. Like I got to meet Mark, uh, I forget the year when he first came there, um, would have been probably Oh six, probably. And I had already done a, a couple of years of just kettlebell training. It was, new, you know, he was coming with some new stuff and kind of like a more intense, like version of CrossFit at the time. And, uh, it was really cool. And I think it was not long after, you know, he had him and his crew had mostly him, uh, but they had lived in a warehouse and trained the, you know, trained the cast of the 300. So he was definitely a big name in, in strength and conditioning and fitness at the time. And, you know, he, a lot of, a lot of what he said really resonated uh, without going too specific into the details, but I really liked, um, you know, the strength on, or the, uh, sorry, the emphasis on strength to weight and power to weight ratio. Cause I always wanted to get stronger without getting too much bigger. Right. And, uh, and that was probably born out of his experience in the mountains and, and whatever. And he had this, like, I think the saying was you can make the engine bigger, but you still have to carry the engine. And like, I just thought that was very interesting. So did some strength and conditioning and fitnessing, if you will, with him. And I would later, I would actually later bring him to the command for another like training trip. Uh, but then I actually got an opportunity to climb uh, Denali with him. Uh, and he had, you know, been a kind of a, definitely a staple on that mountain and a, you know, legendary kind of climber on that mountain. So he was our guide on that mountain. Isn't he the fastest to climb it? I think he is, or was, I don't, I, you know, those records get broken so regularly right, now, right. but yeah, he definitely was the, I think at the time he held a record cause he did it all in the, instead of carrying like all this weight for multiple stops. Like, I think he did it in a continuous, like 72 hour push. Right. Like, Dang. so he could carry less weight cause he didn't stop and sleep or something ridiculous like that. And I was like, that's insane. And then, wow. you know, it got, I'm pretty sure it got broken, but it was a big deal at the time. And he, he climbed some really difficult stuff and, you know, had some interesting stuff to say around fitness and whatever. So, that was really cool. And then we, uh, he didn't guide us on Aconcagua, but his kind of group did. Right. So, um, one of his close, a couple of his close friends did. Uh, so we worked with either him or his group on those mountaineering trips. Um, and then Pavel, I'd met through, you know, really close friend of mine named John Foz, uh, who died in extortion. Um, and he actually grew up in Minneapolis training with Pavel. So, Pavel, like Foss did? 
Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah. So, and I had, so Pavel came to the command to teach us how to do kettlebell training. And I had been doing it for a while. So shortly after that, like I took leave and went up to Minnesota and got my certificate, um, which was cool. And then I just kind of got, you know, kind of got into it. I just liked how you could do your strength and your cardio, you know, relatively take with take, not taking up much space in your home gym. And, uh, you know, Eddie, you'd, you'd appreciate this. So I did a, I did, it was have been my, uh, 2006 summer deployment. And, um, I went, so we would have been Iraq and I, I did for 90 days. All I did, uh, there's a program called Rite of Passage, which was from one of his books. Right. And mm-hmm. all it is, is three days a week you do like kettlebell swings and clean impresses. And so before that deployment, I literally, I tested myself on our, on one of the, like, I kind of put myself through this ringer, right? I did a deadlift, um, pull-ups, weight, like a body weight bench press test. And then I went out and ran a, like a 5k, right? And then on that deployment, all I did was those two exercises, swings and like, these clean and presses with a kettlebell. And I came back and my dead, my, my bench press maintained my deadlift went up my runtime maintained with no real running. Uh, and my pull-ups like skyrocketed, uh, oh, wow. and all of a sudden I could do like muscle ups and I could never do those before. So I found it to be like, okay, wait a second. So again, I already had the capacity to do those things. So I, I'm not saying, swings and clean and presses are going to teach you how to bench and deadlift. But if you already have those abilities and for a few months, all you do is a clean and press and a kettlebell swing, they're not going to go down. Right. In fact, some of them might go up. So I found, I, mm-hmm. I was like, these are that that's like, to me, like very efficient use of your time. Right. Like to do two exercises and everything to kind of stay close to maintain. Anyway, yeah, that's what absolute that's minimal what gear. So, huh? With absolute minimal gear. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. You can throw it in the trunk of your car. Yep. Yeah. Oh. And that's another thing. You can take them outside. Yeah. Like you said, to a park, to the beach, to whatever. So that's what, I mean, it was then. So that would have been 2006. That's when I was like sold, sold. I was like, wait a second. How's that possible? Anyway. I, I want to, uh, for, for the listeners out there, I want you to notice something like he, he did a kind of, a test and then he did a few months on a deployment doing a certain exercise or exercises and then he tested himself again i'm sure you read books you listen to people you you get wisdom when you can get it but he figured it out himself he put himself through the test did a workout himself because everyone's body is different the way you do things the way and some things that work for him might not work for others some things that he just said are like money and then he re, uh, redid it. I think this day and age, we're like, well, this guy said this, so it's got to be true. Or this girl says this, so I'm going to yeah. do that now. It's great to get that information, but you put it to the test and you did that. And I think that's that's a great thing to do is little experiments of what you can do with yeah. all kinds of work, but your fitness as well. So now that's yeah. that's that's awesome to do. Yeah, thanks, bro. It was it was so interesting to me. Um, I wouldn't have you know wouldn't have believed it. And I would say again, that's my experience, not. You know, it may or may not work for you, but it worked. It, I did it and it worked for me. Um, and I think also it, it's important, like kettlebell, kettlebells are not going to cure cancer, right? I mean, some people are really big fans of them, but I already knew how to deadlift before that. And I knew, right. you know, I knew these things. So it's like, it maintained capacities I already had. My deadlift actually went from like, it it went to like 450 and I weighed 180. So wow. it was like two and a half body weight from, and I didn't deadlift for 90 days plus. That's it crazy, just, man. There's just so much volume of swings. And I also lost weight. Like I lost weight doing that program. So it's like, yeah, froze a beast. Just so you guys know, froze like just all muscle. I got a, I got a confession. I used to make fun of him for the kettlebells. Cause I was always going to the gym like Arnold just lifted weights, lifted weights. And I, and, uh, 
I use them now. I do swings all the freaking time. I, I love it, man. I love yeah. like the full, but I love it. I love it. So I'm sorry. You were right. I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> all right, man. I do deadlifts. No, it's good now. stuff, I'll dude. I'll do some deadlifts now or some, you know, squats. <laughs> No, it's, it's definitely, yeah. He, I remember you would always do like the craziest workouts. I even saw you at the, one of the gyms in Virginia beach. You were actually certifying someone else, I believe in, in CrossFit and all that stuff. And like, so yeah, you're, I, I know you're big into it and uh, know what you're talking about. So that's cool. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. It's always, you know, it's always been like, uh, I don't know if I'd say a passion or an addiction. Yeah. You got to do what you like. You, you yeah. love it. You got to do what yeah. you like. Like, yeah. I can't stand running. I will never run, but I will do X, Y, and Z. You know what I mean? It's just, you know, yep. it's just whatever, whatever you dig. Well, so. you're, a, you're kind of a, an experimenter. I mean, you're bro, you're on the, the front end of stuff. You're the first guy by a factor of 10 years that I ever met who did intermittent fasting. Oh yeah. Right. I, I mean, you were the absolute earliest adopter that I know. And now the whole world thinks it's great. Yeah. Oh, I was doing that, yeah, for a long time, or like, oh, MCT oil in your coffee, or whatever. And I'm, you know, I'm, are you still I, doing the one meal a day? I do two. I do two okay. now because I kind of got to where. And there are so there are times when I'll do one meal a day. Um, a lot, I would say, most days I'll have a snack at like two p.m. Right, it might be yogurt and fruit, and then a big meal at dinner. So, and at, like, I'll often have a really big meal at seven and then go to bed by 10 or whatever. And it's just partially because I love to just keep going. And I notice like when I stop for a big lunch, I just slow down. So um, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a doctor and that's not medical advice, but it works for me. (laughs) It's true. Uh, uh, Eat like a sandwich with bread or whatever. Um, you get, I mean, that's what we say. You get up oh, and got the food coma. Everyone mm-hmm. talks about the food coma after lunch. And we, the trips that we've done together, we, we talk about it, got a food oh, coma. Yeah. Like yeah. We, we always talk about it, but yeah, you're right. I mean, yeah. I just, some people just like food. Yeah. I mean, I do. I, <laughs> and that's why it works better for me to have what, like a snack and then a giant meal at dinner and like, yeah. And then crash. <laughs> yeah. Yep, I hear you, dude. Tell us about Defy. Tell us about what you're doing now. Yeah, that's what I'm about to jump on. Get it? Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, you know, since I got out of the military, I've tried a little of this and a little of that, um, from firearms to fitness to you know whatever. And uh, I'm working for Defy now, and it's uh, it's a really cool company. Um, we company started uh, originally in 2019, but we didn't like get really rolling until like our first big purchase orders from distributors were in, uh, uh, 2021, um, like April, March, April. And, uh, between that time and July of this year. So just over really just over a year, we've uh, grown into like 11,000 stores. So, um, really taking off quickly. Uh, we started, we started as a CBD beverage, uh, so we had a CBD beverage and then um, we always kind of planned on having like, instead of, we didn't want to be a CBD company. Uh, we wanted to be a performance brand. So we, we also came out with an energy drink called the uh, Defy Boost. So it's like a lightly caffeinated uh, energy drink with an immunity blend. Um, it also has like some uh, aminos in it uh, and beetroot. So it uh, helps your blood flow. Like it's a vasodilator. Um, so that's been a very good product for us. And then we have our alkaline water, uh, which is like, it's very similar to like an Essentia. Um, I have one right here. Uh, but we donate a portion of proceeds back to uh, different charities and uh one of the charities is the Disabled American Veterans, uh, the DAV, which uh, really helped me out because I had been out for 10 plus years and I didn't have a, I didn't have the right rating from the VA. Uh, like, so my buddies, Eddie, maybe even you said it, but like people are like, how, like I had like 20% from the VA, right? Yeah. And they're like, whoa, that's not right, dude. You got to refile. And I never... I just heard horror stories about refiling. So um, I went through the DAV, which basically you sign a power of attorney 
and they do it for you. They get your labs, your tests and whatever. And literally after that, like two months later, the VA came back a hundred percent permanent and final. So I was how like, was that working with them? Was it good? The DAV? Was, DAV was amazing. Uh, there's a lot of awesome, uh, veteran service organizations and nonprofits. I mean, I can't, I mean, there's so many great ones, uh, but really none have, you know, and I support several, uh, but none have made like a bigger difference to me for me. Right. So it's good to know. Um, Pass that would, information on. Yeah. If any, if you know anyone, I've passed it on to a friend of mine who is a, a former ranger and a, a friend of mine in Colorado. We actually, we started a veterans ministry in the church that we went to at the time. And I told him like, cause he had like 10% from the VA. I'm like, you got to go sign this paperwork with the DAV and get them to re-rate you. And they got, you know, he was a hundred percent permanent final two months later. So um, it's just an amazing organization. So if you know people or if people are listening that are out and they don't think they have their right, you know, the correct rating from the VA, like I can't, on a, on a five-star rating, I'd give them 10. So. <laughs> wow. And there's a, there's a lot of guys out there that have a certain percentage and they, when they deserve more, but they right. won't do it because they do not want to deal with the VA. Mm-hmm. And that's so sad. And there's also people out there that don't, that have a rating that they don't deserve. I mean, it, it, it's, it's both sides, but it's, it, I think keeps them. I mean, we could have a separate conversation about that later. <laughs> right. I I, so I actually, one of the, I had somebody who worked for me at when I ran the gun range in Denver and he was a hundred percent and he never like, he just had PTSD because he was on a base in Iraq and it got shelled once. And uh, you know, anyway, I think there's, I think it's a, it's kind of a weird, it's something, it's something I've thought about a lot lately. Cause you have, there's veterans and they, you know, they deserve more, they need more and they need our support. But then I think there's also like a, a side of maybe it's some of them. There's so much entitlement. And I think that in, I think it's the entitlement that has led to Mm -hmm. the lack of, you know, accountability and mental health and all these things for the, for the first time ever. I think it was like last year or the year before I heard this from my friend who is uh, like a director or something at the, at team red, white, and blue, another very awesome uh, veteran charity. First time ever uh, veterans are now more likely to be obese uh, than non-veterans. No right? kidding. Wow. First time. Right. Dang. So, I mean, obviously the, there's suicide pan, you know, epidemic and drinking and all these other health problems, but I, you know, there's, I don't, I don't have the answer, but I know that uh, I think it's a mixture of, of many things. <laughs> that's crazy. That's yeah. nuts, man. That's no, but I, I work at, sad. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say it for defy. It's been awesome. Um, I love being, you know, back, uh, back in, uh, you know, on a small team, uh, rapid growth company, learning new things, doing new things. Um, my, uh, my job there is COO. So I kind of handle production and fulfillment and things like that. It just, uh, it's a lot of fun and, uh, we're in 11,000 stores. So, uh, you know, that's, you're, you're that's good stuff. Website and find out where to buy it. <laughs> I saw your product at my local grocery store. I sent you a picture. Yeah. Was was like, awesome. Oh my God, fro check. Look, yeah. look what I'll, I got. <laughs> you're like, I'll I know. <laughs> yeah. It's good stuff. It's awesome. Thanks bro. <laughs> so awesome, dude. What's it like being on a team with, I'm assuming all civilians other than you. It's great. You know, I think, um, and I are, I had, I have a good, uh, it's, it's funny. I've been out 12 years. So I was in 12 years and I was out 12 years and really it was, uh, you know, it was hard at first, like, especially leaving the command. And then like when I got the first like job, job at the gun range that I co-founded and, you know, I had, I had people at various levels of motivation there. Right. So I had some, uh, you know, go getters, you know, that were like manager types. And then I had, you know, 10 or $15 an hour, like cash register people. And it took me a while to like, Hey, I gotta, I gotta tone down my expectation here for this person doing that job. 
because he's he didn't go through buds or our selection and that's it's a different thing right so really like had to change my uh, expectation with that and then i've had you know i worked at strong first and it was the same thing you know had some people that were more va- more motivated than others um and then obviously the the NRA was a whole different animal, but, uh, now that I'm back, uh, you know, I'm back at a, at a, back in the private sector and a for-profit company that's, you know, young and everyone's hungry and we're growing. So it's great because, uh, we have a lot of go-getters and, uh, just people who want to be there. That's important. That's important. Yeah. Yep. That is hugely important. If you, so it, it Fro just named off like four more things that he's been involved with. Like he there's, we would need a podcast probably four days to like hit everything that you've done, you know, since you've been out of the military. Uh, But one thing I like to get towards like the end or whatever, like with all that you've talked about and and the things that you've done that we haven't talked about mindset is, is key to everything. You, you know, that from, you mentioned earlier, like buds and your mindset of doing this on that. Um, If you could give the listeners like, Fro Eric Frohart, like what is what is the mindset thing that you need to have, or you could like, hey, I would think about this, or I guess lessons learned. Like, what would you say to the audience? Oh, yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me think here. I mean, how much time do I got? No, um, <laughs> you know, I would say, I mean, like, there's a lot of things I've learned. Um, you know, I think. Um, You got to, you know, you every, no matter what you do, right. um, You got to expect problems, right. So it doesn't matter if you're, you know, if you're at a fitness company, a firearms business or a beverage place, um, you have to expect problems and you have to look at those as opportunities, right. There's going to be, and I think nowadays people, there's a, a small problem or even a medium sized problem. And people just like go and look for something easier and they're hoping not to hoping it, it'll be easy. Well, everything worth doing is going to be hard. So you've got to, I think you've got to expect to have those problems and face them. Um, You know, you got to blame yourself when things go wrong um, to an extent. Right. Um, but I think one thing that's really, that's really helped me a lot is to kind of, uh, and this has been a, I've evolved off of like everything that I used to think everything that went wrong was my fault because of, you know, extreme ownership. Uh, and I think right. that's right to an extent, but I think that's also a little arrogant because at some point you realize that you're not in charge of everything. Like, you can do everything right and still lose. Like that happens. That happened to Louis. Like he did everything right in that Mm -hmm. moment. And uh, he lost that night or, you know, he died in combat. So I think if you, I I would say, you know, one of the mottos I try to live by now is just do your best, make sure it's your best. So, and be really honest with yourself. Uh, Like, Hey, I gave it my best. Like, this is the best I can do. And now I need to release the outcome to an extent because there are things that are, you know, whether it's in the, you know, at at a beverage company, it could be, you know, market conditions uh, or in combat, you could do everything right and then drive over an IED, right? But if you do your best and uh, you're honest with yourself that you gave it your all, uh, you can release the outcome because some of it, you know, God might have other plans, right? Uh, and sometimes when he does, things just work out better than, you know, better than I would have planned anyway. Crazy so. how that works, isn't it? Took yep. me about two decades to figure that one out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that's a freaking great wisdom right there. For your listeners, like what he just said, give it your all. I mean, you cannot, and it's so true. We cannot just control as much as we like to sometimes every little situation, but like you said, just do your best. And it might be so simple, but that's so true. That, that is wisdom. That, that was a great answer, man. Great answer. Thanks brother. Um, Keith, what do you got, man? I'm, I'm that's, this is a solid podcast. Yeah. Where can, uh, where can folks find you? 
Where can they learn more about Defy? Yeah. Uh, hmm, www.drinkdefy.com. Uh, or if you just Google it, Defy or Defy Drinks, it'll show up. Um, and then I usually post about it on my social media. Uh, and that's, I don't, it's just Eric Frohart on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. And we'll throw all links and everything onto the description of the video or wherever you're listening. And so you guys can follow Fro and then get all the information that you need to. So this is good stuff. So this is all, man, this is an awesome podcast. Yeah, brother. Thanks, man. Glad we did it. You gave me clarity of my heart, dude, just uh, talking about certain things and certain ops, different perspectives now that the dust has settled from years ago. So right, it, it was good. It was good, man. So Good, man. Well, glad I dude, could help. Dude, You're one of the for- first guys that we talked about breaking on this thing. So we're, we're proud to have you. Yeah. Well, it's an uh, honor to be here. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah. And best of luck to you, man, with all the things. And again, we're always, you know, a phone call away, text away, whatever. If you need anything, we're here for you, dude. Love you, man, so much. So Likewise. thanks for being on here, buddy. Yeah, man. You, bro. You, bro.